President of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences, past presidents of the Academy, vice presidents of the Academy, fellows, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, students, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the fellows of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences, Ghana's premier learned society, I warmly welcome you to day one of the three-day lecture marking the 50th in the series of J.B. Dankwa Memorial Lectures given on the Academy platform since 1968. The J.B. Dankwa Memorial Lecture Series was instituted in 1968 in memory of a foundation member of the Academy, Dr. Joseph Boache Dankwa who died in prison in February 1965. The event consists of a series of three lectures delivered on varying themes ranging, ranging from law, philosophy, literature, medicine, health, religion, nation building, and others. The maiden lecture was delivered in 1968 by His Excellency W. B. Van Lee, also a foundation member of the Academy, on the topic, the law, human rights, and the judiciary. The theme for tonight's presentation is Women in, in History, the case of Ghana, pre-colonial, colonial, and post-colonial, to be delivered by a distinguished fellow of the Academy who will soon be introduced. Before I introduce the chairman for the function, I would like on behalf of the Academy to publicly acknowledge the following sponsors who have donated generously towards the occasion. National Petroleum Authority, Star Ghana, Ghana Investment Promotion Center, Petroleum Commission, the African Regent Hotel, and Dankwa Institute. Shall we give the sponsors a round of applause? Thank you. Now the chairman for tonight's event is Professor Abba Bento Andam, president of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences. She's a chartered physicist with a doctorate in cosmic radiation physics. She was elected a fellow of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences in October 2003 and became the president in 2017. Ladies and gentlemen, shall we please welcome our chairman for this occasion. Professor Kilapa Soya, immediate past president of the academy, past presidents of the Academy, Council and Fellows of the Academy, the family of Dr. J.B. Dankwa, always here with us. For as long as I have been a fellow of the Academy, they are always here 
with us at the JB Dankwa Lectures. The family of the celebrant, the Perby family, students, this must be Accra girls. Is this Accra girls? Yes, Accra girls and Accra Wesley Girls High School and uh, Presecans in their nice blue shirt. Uh, no one can miss you out in that Presbyterian shirt. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences, in honoring one of their own kind, Dr. J.B. Dankwa instituted this series of lectures and every year we have had a distinguished celebrant. This year is no exception. Professor Akosia Duma Pebi and Akura, the Akura ladies, the girls uh, Akura, they have distinctive features. So if I describe that to you, you will know she is uh, a lady Akura, married to Mr. Randolph Baapebi of the Abwade clan of Equaping Mampo. Our celebrant is from two Mampons. Asante Mampong and Equape Mampong. And from Achimota, where she was a prefect, she then went to Lebon reading to read the history, archaeology, and geography. We can see that she was already an outstanding student right from primary school at a time when Ms. Agbeho was trying to teach adult Ghanaians the new national anthem. This primary school student knew all of it. And then on and on and on until now she ranks as a professor of history this evening sharing with us her concept about women in history. And that is a long and tall order, I'm sure. But with her, we know that she will tell us what it's all about. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, our celebrant for the J.B. Dankwa series of lectures for 2018, Professor Akosia Adoma Pebi. Thank you. Good evening, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to share a little of some research I've been doing. It's ongoing. In going through the pages of world history, it is significant to observe <clears throat> contributions women have made in their societies from ancient times to modern times. These lectures aim at unearthing women's contributions in Ghana in the social field, political life, in the military sphere, in religion, and in the economy, and noting differences within the time frame. So pre-colonial, colonial, and post-colonial, and their impact on society at large. Dr. J.B. Dankwa, in whose honor these lectures are being given, came from an African society in which women played important roles in family life and society. It was a matrilineal setting in which roles played by women 
were visible and prominent. The emphasis today will dwell on occupation rules and pattern in the pre-colonial period, while tomorrow's lecture will look at the impact of colonialism on the rules. Concluding the series the third day, we will highlight roles in the post-colonial era, illustrating examples recorded in our history and ending with the caption, we have always been visible, voices of Ghanaian women through time and space. I want to address and look at women in the pre-colonial social structure of Ghana. During the pre-colonial period, Ghana's social structure was based on the kinship system. Oral tradition and written records describe women as the fabric around whom the kinship system was formed. Kinship ties, ties were derived from three main ways, first through blood, second through marriage, and third through adoption. Every Ghanaian was a member of a family, a lineage, and a clan, and women were regarded as the bedrock of the social system. The family was matrilineal, patrilineal, or both. In the case of the Mo of the Brown Hafu region and the Gamashi people of the Greater Accra region, they were both. They practiced both patrilineal and matrilineal. The clans also followed the same pattern. In the Mole Dagbani, among the Mole Dagbani in the northern region, Ewega and Danwe, and Guan, they were patrilineal. The Akan were matrilineal and consisted of 17 groups. Patrilineal meant the family line was traced to the father's line, and matrilineal meant the family line was traced through the mother's line. Among the patrilineal groups, it was believed that the biological link between one generation and another was provided by the blood of the father. Whilst among the matrilineal groups, it was believed that this link was through the mother. Bishop Sapo states that the Akan attitude to the sexes was that the value of girls was almost inestimable. And I quote, Bishop Sapo says, in them, the matrilineal puts its hope for their future existence. It depends upon them to provide suitable persons to take up offices and to strengthen the lineage. A man without sisters is haunted by a sense of frustration because in the absence of sister sons, he is hard put to act, get heirs to whom he may bequeath his legacy. When the news of a baby's birth spreads, women simultaneously ask, Oye dien? What sex is it? The answer is invariably Oba or Oberima, female or male. The reaction to the first is an undisguised facial expression of joy, accompanied by Yeda Onyamias, we thank God. On hearing it is a boy, however, they are one to say less jubilant things like a year, well, it is good. But I'm sure others will do dispute what Bishop Sapon is saying, that he's done a lot of research in this area. It is not a war, we part of that wrong notion, asking whether it is a human being or something else. It is a girl, and matrilineal societies are very happy with this. With respect to upbringing of girls and boys, up to the age of seven, Girls and boys were main responsibility of their mothers. The mothers had to teach their children good manners, to be serviceable and respectful. When the boy was moved to his father after the age of seven, the father continued to train his son and to teach him his occupation. The girls continued to assist with the household duties and to also learn their mother's occupation be it trading, working on the farm, and so on. 
women in the traditional political structure. Ghana's traditional political structure was either a centralized or non-centralized one. Centralized states were headed by a king or chief and ably assisted by a queen, plus other important functionaries. Non-centralized states were headed by a headman, also ably assisted by a woman who sometimes is not seen. But in the case of some of the ethnic groups in the north as well as in the south, it was headed by a traditional priest. The Guan, who are believed to be the indigenous of Ghana, were non-centralized, and they lived in three main areas, the northern part, the coastal plains, and the Volta River Valley. It was among the centralized states, especially the Akan, that the role of women in the political discourse was visibly seen. The traditional political structure was very well organized from the village level to the town level. At the village head was a male called Yodiku, and he had a female counterpart who was sometimes silent. That is not visibly seen all the time, but to assist him. The head of the town was the king or the chief, ably supported by the queen. The queen was regarded as the custodian of the culture and the repertoire of knowledge. She, together with other elderly women, gave sound advice. Whenever there was a crisis, the advice was given, let us go and ask the old woman. And I'm sure we all know how women are very careful about detail. Anything you have forgotten, ask a woman. She will go through the pages of history and give you all the details about it. I think women deserve it. Too. What will the men do without women? When a king or chief's tool became vacant, it was the duty of the queen to nominate a new one. She also played the role of an advisor and guide to the king or the chief. She was the only one who had the right to rebuke the king or chief in public. Whenever the king or chief sat in public, the queen sat on his left. The idea was to assist him whenever he needed help. The queen has special jurisdiction over the women in, the, in her society. She was the chief valuing point for women in the society and mobilized women for every necessary action she was responsible for all domestic matters affecting women. The queen also had her separate court where she heard judicial cases. She was assisted in educating cases by female counselors and functionaries, women in the military sphere. Women played important roles in the traditional military sphere. They accompanied the men to the battlefield and engaged in dancing and singing to support the men, cheering them up. It was like a cheering squad, so it's not a new modern invention. Women have been cheering squads from time immemorial, cheering the men on and encouraging them. In times past, when villages were attacked, the women stirred the men up with war cries and supplied them with stones and sticks for offense and defense. If an attack was too sudden or caught the men unprepared, the women, especially those nursing young babies, filled in quite adequately by bringing out all accessible defensive weapons. Why is women? Nobody would suspect that a nursing mother with a baby at the back was organizing weapons for offensive and defensive reasons. One of the qualities required in pre-colonial Ghana, whenever a queen was being chosen, was bravery. This was because it was expected that if for any reason a king or chief could not go to war, the queen should be able to step in. Women were also part of Asafu companies in some states in Ghana, and these companies were established to protect the inhabitants against external attacks. They were not part of the main army, but they could be mobilized during a war to join the main army. They also provided personal services to the kings and chiefs. For example, making farms, building houses, etc. 
Among the Fanti people, the female wings were headed by female captains. And in 1848, one of such female captains from Ahanta marched as head of the Asafo Company in the expedition of British Governor Winnet to Zema. Winnet was surprised to find a woman dressed in full military attire heading a female company. Amazing. Women and religion. Women in pre-colonial Ghana had options to practice either the traditional religion, Islam, or Christianity. Women played active roles in the options they chose, some as leaders, others as followers. And this is a whole book. If you want to deal with religion, we won't leave tonight. But I'm just picking out a few points. Some as leaders, others as followers. The traditional religion was the belief in the Supreme God, the Creator. The Akan people called him Nyame. The Ewe and Ga Adangri called him Mau. The Gonja called him Eboru. The Mampusi called him Muni. And the Talansi called him Nani women. It was believed in the traditional religion that this God was so great and so far off that he needed to be worshipped through intermediaries. And these were the lesser gods and their ancestors. Just as a king or chief would not be approached directly by their subjects, except through office holders, so also God could not be approached directly except through these intermediaries. I remember when we were children growing up, we were told that first God was with us on the earth, but because women like pounding fufu, as more we pounded fufu, the more God moved higher up. I don't know whether some of you heard that story growing up. And many of us believe it was true until after a while we grew up to realize that God inhabits the heavens and the earth and he is to be feared and awed. The gods were believed to be controlled by the supreme god from whom they derived their powers. Reverence of the ancestors was a result in the belief that death was not the end of a person. At death, the soul was supposed to go to the land of spirits to join other departed souls. In the spirit world, people were supposed to retain their earthly status and honor. So chiefs and queens continued to maintain their status, and servants and slaves continued their status of serving. Among the Talansi and many northern societies, the earth priest called the Tindana was a powerful functionary of considerable authority. Land was deemed to belong to the living and the dead. And for this reason, land could not be alienated. It was held in trust by the living for the present and the future generations. And Dr. J.B. Danka often stresses a lot in his works that when we have property, we leave some for the living and we also reserve some for future generations. I wish our traditional rulers would continue this wise wisdom and leave some land for the future generations. The Akan believed that land was created on Thursday and hence they called it Asasiya and permitted no work to be done on that day. And land was named after a woman, not a man, Asasiya. It connoted fertility, growth, creativity, etc. Women made offerings from time to time to the lesser gods and their ancestors. They made petitions for abundant harvest, need for children, wealth, long life, etc. With respect to Islam, the religion spread peacefully into Ghana from the 15th century onwards. Two main agents were responsible for the spread. The Islamized Mandi traders from the northwestern part of Africa and the Muslim traders from the northeastern part of Africa. Islam spread through the northern part of Ghana to the broad Hafa and Asante regions, as well as through the central region and gradually to the coast. Women accepted the faith mainly through family ties and belongings. And Christianity began its influence in Ghana through the activities of European tra travelers and missionaries from the 15th century onwards. Portugal, a fervent Catholic nation, took the lead. They were followed by a host of other missionaries from Holland, England, Basel, and Switzerland, etc. 
According to historian F.K. Bua, the seed of the Christian religion in the country was sown in the 15th century. But the permanent establishment on, on a nationwide scale began from the second decade of the 19th century. By 1980, about half of Ghana's population was on record as belonging to one or other of the Christian churches. And although the nation could not be regarded as a Christian country, the churches were exercising remarkable influence on the society. There is no contention about the fact that many churches are filled today by women. The country has also witnessed the rise of many female pastors and church leaders. The Christian religion brought about a lot of positive effects to the country in literacy, formal education, translation of local languages into writing, establishment of clinics and hospitals, and so on. A place where women were visibly seen in pre-colonial Ghana was in the economy. Ghana's pre-colonial economy was based on three pillars, agriculture, trade, and industry. Oral and documentary evidence testify to the importance of agriculture in the Ghanaian economy and the fact that the farmers were both male and female. They produced food crops like rice, and yam, fruits, and vegetables. When the Portuguese arrived on the coast in the 15th century, they noticed a great deal of local exchange in agricultural products. In the 1600s, de Maris was highly impressed by the contributions of hard-working peasants to the availability of food in the markets. Peasant women supplied the markets with sweet potatoes, yams, maize, rice, oranges, lime, banana, and sugar cane. And the French trade abound observed in the 17th century that the markets along the coast were well supplied with corn, roots, and fruits. The food producers included women, and they were from Fetu, Apri, Eguafu, Ahanta, Shama, Axim, Komenda, and other Akan states in the interior. Is it surprising that women can get the Farmer of the Year award? If you know history, you know that they are historically doing what they've done in the past. The indigenous crops grown in the forest were root crops, like the yellow and white yam. In the savanna belt, the crops grown were root crops and cereals, like rice, guinea corn, and millet. The introduction of a large variety of food crops from the New World into Ghana enhanced agriculture. The Maris lists some of the crops that included sweet potatoes, oranges, lemons, sugar cane, pineapple, banana, red pepper, ginger, granules, and tobacco. In addition to this list were maize, melon, pawpaw, varieties of yam, and rice. From the 15th to the 19th centuries, the popular food crops grown in the savanna belt were the indigenous and foreign varieties of yam, millet, rice, cowpea, and beans. In the forest belt was grown, was grown the indigenous and foreign varieties of yam, as well as cassava and cocoa. Two systems of agriculture evolved, local peasant agriculture and plantation agriculture. With respect to the latter, it was usually the king's chiefs and queens, and a few individuals who owned large tracts of land and there were few men who had large tracts of land on which they farmed. In the northern part of Ghana, male and female farmers grew maize, millet, guinea corn, and rice. The land around the lower end of the Volta, periodically flooded by the river, was another important producer of cereals. In the forest, yam, sweet potatoes, cocoa yam, cassava, and plantains were grown throughout the country. Sugarcane was also grown in the Volta flat plain. Tobacco was grown in large quantities almost throughout the whole country. Women were a great and important resource so far as collecting of food crops was concerned. In fact, according to archaeologists and anthropologists, as civilizations evolved from a hunting gathering stage to one based on settled farming, it was the women were the first farmers. 
This was because during the hunting and gathering stage of life, the men did the hunting and the uh, fishing, and the women did the gathering. And as the women picked their crops to feed their families, and they threw the seeds out, the seeds germinated. And so gradually, women started farming around the houses, and it became a wider scale issue. So women had believed to have been the first farmers in settled agriculture. I think women deserve a clap for that. In the savannah of northern Ghana, women collected shea butter, nuts, baobab, tamarind, and dawadawa. In the first of southern Ghana, women collected kula nuts and palm nuts. Along the coast, the oil palm nuts and coconuts were the crops collected. Of all the food plants, the kula nut became the most important export crop during the era of trade between Ghana and states across the Sahara to North Africa. The kula nuts grew wild in the forest belt from the Pra River to Sunyani. It was an important crop in the Po and Achim areas. The crop was exported mainly to Salaga. Salah became the pivotal point of trade from the Mediterranean world through North Africa to Ghana and from uh, Accra through Rome, Asante Brom to the north. And Salaga became known as the Binigo, the town of Kulanat. And interesting enough, the Akan people, especially the women who took part in this, this Kulanat picking, hardly used the kola nuts. It was mostly sent to the north and further up to the Mediterranean world. During the closing decades of the 19th century, the, de the kola nuts were also exported southward to the coastal ports and sent to Europe and the US. Another important activity was fishing in pre-colonial Ghana. Notable areas of fish were along the coast in the Afram River, Lake Busumtri, and so on. There was a division of labor along gender lines, so far as the fishing industry in Ghana, pre-colonial Ghana, was concerned. When the men went fishing and they returned, they always handed their fish to the women. It could be their mother, wife, sister, aunt or daughter of the fishermen. The women smoked dried or salted the fish for both home consumption and for the local markets. The Maris, the Portuguese traveler, added his voice to oral tradition by remarking the 1600s on the diligence of the coastal women who, after processing the fish, carried it over 100 to 200 miles into the interior to be sold. Many of the women carried their children on their backs during the long journeys. They were assisted by their female servants and slaves. Women on trade. I've just remembered a few times I used to get up very early to go to Salagam, um, Sraha, the Accra coast, to get fish when it was in season. And I noticed that sometimes you go near the canoes and the men wouldn't mind you at all. They would always give it to a woman, either to their wife or daughter and sister. At that time, I hadn't done this research, so I didn't know that I was the odd one out. I didn't, I wasn't part of the line that received the fish. And any time you ask somebody in the canoe, can you give me a fish? The person will point to another woman and say, go to that woman for the fish. So the gender division in fishing was and is still real. Through women and trade, throughout the pre-colonial period, women were also highly involved in trade. There were three major types of trade, intrastate trade, interstate trade, and long distance trade. Intrastate trade was conducted in a large number of markets scattered throughout the kingdom or state. Some of the markets in the northern part of Ghana were in Salaga, Wa, and Boli. In Asante and Brongahafu, some of the markets were held in Atebu, Kintampo, and Kumasi. In the coastal areas, Elmina, Cape Coast, Accra, Keta were important markets. The markets were held either daily or periodically, and the commodities sold were mainly foodstuffs. Male and female servants and slaves served as carriers of trade goods 
while a few others sold and bought goods on behalf of their owners. Women traders overshadowed their male counterparts in this type of trade because it was a convenient adjunct to household duties and farming. Interstate trade was carried on between two or more states. For example, there was trade between Asante and Fante states in which Asante received dried or smoked fish in exchange for gold. There was also trade between the Ekriapim and Ga states in which Ekriapim supplied foodstuffs in exchange for salt and dried fish. There was also a lot of interstate trade among the Fante states. Almina exchanged fish for palm wine, maize and cotton from Fetu, Abrim and Komenda. From Maxim, Elmina received fruits and rice in exchange for fish and gold. Elmina also received foodstuffs from Iguafo, Ahanta and Shama. In the case of the intrastate trade, male and female servants and slaves were used as carriers, while others transacted business on behalf of their owners. Long distance trade covered several states and long distances, as the name implies. And this resulted in the evolution of a complex network of trade routes spanning the length and breadth of colonial Ghana, and also connecting Ghana with its African neighbors from Senegal to uh, central Congo, and also to the north across the Sahara. Women traders were very active in the long distance trade, and they were assisted by their male and female servants and slaves. The women assisted by these servants and slaves carried salt, fish, and other agricultural products in exchange for items such as cowrie shells, silk, leatherware, cloths, mats, shawls, and so on. In the northern part of Ghana, cola nuts, ivory, and gold were exchanged for products from the savannah belt of West Africa and the Sahara and the Mediterranean regions. On the coast, Gold, ivory, and diamond were exchanged for European goods like cloth and provision, women, and industry. The important industries in Ghana during the pre colonial period in which women participated were gold mining, salt making, rubber production, and the art and craft industries such as pottery, basketry, cotton spinning, soap, soap, soap making bead manufacturing, and polishing. With respect to gold mining, Ghana's gold was exploited from three geological formations. The first was alluvial gold, derived from the beds of rivers flowing along the Birim Rocks formation. The second was derived from coastal sand found mostly between Apam and Axim. And the third was from alluvial deposits. Panning was the principal means of winning gold from the loose alluvium, from the coastal sand, and this was usually the work of women. Women and their servants and slaves, as well as their children, were involved. The alluvium was worked on throughout the year, but the coastal sands were panned normally after a heavy downpour. Along the coast, from Fantiland to Accra, women panned gold using stream places. The same method of using stream places to pan alluvial gold was used in the interior along the streams and rivers. When Chi oral traditions also talk about using stream places to pan alluvial gold in the streams and rivers of the Tain, Bisa, Atum, Adeja, and Bhutan. In Asante, alluvial gold through panel was collected in the Tano River, and women played a very active part in panning the gold. Salt was either mined or extracted from lagoon and seawater, and women and their children, as well as their servants and slaves, also played an important role in the salt mining industry. Their servants and slaves dug pits to trap the seawater in Nanda, Usu, Accra, as well as in Winneba, Elmina, Sekindi, and Takrade. Women also assisted in marketing the salt and oral traditions and travelers' account talk about women traversing the length and breadth of the country selling salt. Hard-working women in pre-colonial times, and women are so hard-working. Mining the Dabaya salt, however, in northern Ghana 
was solely the work of men because of the nature of their job. Rubber production was another activity women fully participated in, and the major areas of production were Achimi Biapa, the Kriapem, Kripi, and Waso, with Waso producing the best rubber. Rubber production also took place in Asante and Rome half regions. Another important industry was pottery, and that was traditionally the work of the women. Although the men dug the clay for the women, they left as soon as they had finished that job, and the women workers did the pottery. They also employed female servants and slaves to help in molding, baking, and selling the pots. Their Adangwe and Kweu areas were popular for this industry. Although cloth weaving was the work of men, women were mainly responsible for spinning the thread. In the northern brown half, Asante and the Volta regions, women were assisted by their female servants and slaves. Soap making was the work of women. Female servants and slaves helped their mistresses cut the peelings of plantain. The peelings were dried and burned to ashes and then soaked in water in a basket and the lean with a fluffy plantain stuff called a hack in a can. Then produce, which was collected in a tree, was boiled in palm oil and other ingredients until the mixture thickened and settled. It was popular soup for most of the country. Many of us call it alata semina now for the young folks. It was a traditional soup many years, many, many years ago. Beads were also an important industry women were involved in, and they were manufactured from special clay from, from granite stones. Again, just as in the pottery industry, the men dug the clay and the women tended um, beads, stones into the beads, and they molded it into the shapes that they desired. The location was very popular among the Ewe and Dama areas, as well as some Akan states. I trust that this short wading you through women in pre-colonial Ghana has given you an idea of what women did and their contribution in the social field, political life, in the military sphere, in religion, as well as in the economy. Tomorrow, we'll look at women's experiences during the colonial period. It was a different picture altogether. It is important to remember what women were before colonial rule, who they, what they did, what they stood for, and what colonial rule did. And then on Wednesday, we look at the post-colonial period. Thank you. Professor Akila Pasoya, immediate past president of the academy, past president of the academy, council and fellows of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences, the family of J.B. Dampa, whom we are celebrating, the celebrant, Professor Akosia Adoma Pebi and her family. Also, I have cited some colleagues of Professor Pebby from the University of Ghana. Historians, you are welcome. Students, Accra Girls, Accra Wesley Girls High School, and the SEC. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we have heard the first of the three-day series of this year's lectures celebrating Dr. J.B. Dampa. Today's lecture has set the tone for the celebrations, what we are to expect for tomorrow and the third day. I have every reason to believe that there is a lot to be learned through these lectures. News and press discussions during this month of February reminded us 
about the work of the suffragettes in the UK. Women who set out to demand a vote for themselves and for other women, votes like their husbands and brothers and fathers. And what these women went through. It is worthy to note that after all that trouble, the suffragettes got victory, but it was victory for women of substance. Women classified as middle class, women who owned property were given votes. If you were a woman and you were poor, in the Great Britain of the suffragettes, your brain couldn't decide who ruled the country. You were not given a vote. So we see this is just about a century ago. But Professor Pebby this evening tells us about the position of women in pre-colonial Ghanaian societies. Let's call them Ghanaian societies because we don't know whether we should call them Gold Coast Society or so. Let's call them pre-colonial Ghanaian societies. We can say from what she said that women had their say. We didn't have to chain ourselves, they didn't have to chain themselves to the rails of parliament to make their point that they must be given a vote. So at the local traditional level in our part of the world, Professor Pebby reminds us that women had a role Women had a special place. Women had a say. And this special place was really a respected position, a position of strength. So I think that we ladies, Accra girls, Accra Wesley uh, girls, Awegehe, you should keep this in mind that long ago, the women in this part of the world, they didn't have to ask for equality uh, with men. The society considered them at par with the men. They contributed their quota. It is a position of strength. We should hold on to it and move on in our country. This business about women's rights and so on. Our society knew that a woman was a precious member of the society. Our society knew that women's rights, a woman's rights were human rights. Somebody has translated this expression into fanti with which I will end. If you pronounce it in a certain way, you are saying rights. A woman's rights are human rights, which in Fanti would go like this. Oba nyama obiarezi. So this, it's really a position that a woman is an effective part. The, you know, it says that if a woman cooks rice, Everybody will eat some of the rights. So a woman's rights are human rights. And this is something that young ladies, you should carry in your mind and you should carry in your heart that you are a woman. You are a special member of the society. You have a role to play. Thank you very much. Mamma, 
Ayajama.